Tena koto te fano o Auckland Unitarian. Tena koto na manu here. No mai, hire mai. Hire mai ki tene fare karakia. Ate atoa tena koto o tena tato katoa. We welcome you into this circle of community. Welcome into this space that Auckland Unitarians have made sacred for the last 116 years and 11 months. <laughs> we come here to unite. We unite in our differences in background and belief. We unite with gratitude and hope. Hope for a world of differences. Hope for a world that honors difference. We unite in community with gratitude for difference. We especially welcome you this morning if you are a visitor just passing through or seeking a spiritual home. We know that coming through those doors can be somewhat scary sometimes for the first time. So we want to assure you that this is safe space for you to be yourself and uh, no, we won't do anything horribly embarrassing to you. <laughs> also know that our service doesn't really end until you've shared a couple with us at morning tea. And uh, it is our prelude to the, the service is our prelude to morning tea. And it is our sacrament of hospitality. Please join us. It won't be complete without you. Now let us move into worship, willing to be authentic with each other, honest within ourselves, and open to connection in all its forms. This Sunday we're going to be focusing on multiculturalism. According to social psychologist John Barry, the success of multiculturalism is dependent on both the cultural maintenance by immigrants and cultural acceptance by host societies. Strong cultural maintenance by immigrants and weak cultural acceptance by host society lead to separation and marginalization. Conversely, weak cultural maintenance by immigrants lead to assimilation into host society culture. When host society is more accepting of ethnic minority culture, cultural maintenance can lead to positive outcomes such as better immigrant integration and economic advantages for the home country. We light this chalice, remembering and honoring our own tradition and celebrating the rich diversity of tradition among us. We search for justice, meaning, and purpose. May we remember that justice, meaning, and purpose live first in deeply listening to one another. For someone of my generation, change has been our reality. When I was born, there were five billion fewer people on the planet. That alone would be enough to overwhelm. But it is hardly the beginning of what we've had to understand, process, and absorb of a reality that literally changes daily. Take the idea of multiculturalism. I did not grow up hearing the word. It didn't reach my consciousness until maybe the mid-70s, maybe because that growing world population wasn't in predominantly white countries. As a result, I have been on the back foot in fully understanding its implications and appreciating what it has to offer. 
in spite of growing up in what my American history books called the Great Melting Pot, in my first 12 years of education in four U.S. Western states, I went to school with only one black person. All my teachers were white. I can remember being slightly acquainted with only two black adults. Sure, I knew about the civil rights movement in the South, but that was far away and could only be seen through my black and white eye of our TV. My only brush with multiculturalism was perusing National Geographic, but I suspect my prepubescent self was more interested in looking at the soft pornographic pictures that, than learning about other cultures. In many respects, my experience was not unlike how multiculturalism came into our consciousness in Aotearoa, New Zealand. The history of who is a New Zealander tracks our becoming a multicultural country. Since we are a country of immigrants, there is no genetic measure of a race that determines who is a New Zealander. It is determined when we declare ourselves to be a New Zealander. The first to be called New Zealanders were the Maori, who were named by European visitors. When Europeans came to stay, they referred to themselves as colonists or settlers. They did not want to be called New Zealanders. They were English. From 1830 on, Europeans began calling the people of the land Maori. This allowed room to change the meaning of who is a New Zealander. By the late 1850s, the faces of New Zealanders were white, not brown. While the European settlers now had a name, they still considered themselves and considered their Anglo-Saxon heritage superior to others. While some Chinese came to work the gold fields in 1865, and Dalmatians came to dig gum, the settlers were committed to maintaining New Zealand as an Anglo-Saxon society. Legislation was passed in the 1880s and 90s, and again in the 1920s to keep non-white immigrants out of the country. While the country was by definition bicultural, British culture dominated that of the Maori. Speaking to rail was forbidden in schools. Only English history was taught. The flag that was saluted was the Union Jack. God Save the King, or Queen, was the national anthem. I suspect there are some here this morning who remember standing for that anthem in the theater before the movie was shown. To be a New Zealander meant be British first albeit a better Britain than those in Mother England. In 1840, at the signing of the Treaty of Waitangi, William Hobson declared the two cultures one people. But the Maori never bought into the idea. For what Hobson meant was amalgamation, where Māori culture was replaced by British civilization. This idea persisted until after the Second World War. In 1901, the women's suffrage leader, Kate Shepard, said, Māori and Pākehā have become one people under one sovereign and one parliament, glorying alike in the one title of New Zealander. At the time, this was considered a progressive view. There were others who exalted what they considered Anglo-Saxon traits of Māori, and argued that they should be considered honorary whites. But not all felt that way. As late as the 1950s, some movie theaters segregated Marty from its white patrons. Yes, while there were two cultures in New Zealand and the Tereo version of the Treaty of Waitangi laid a framework for it being bicultural, it would not be until the late 1960s 
that it would take the first steps to becoming so. By the mid 20th century, it appeared the one people idea had become reality. Marty were participating in the major rituals of New Zealand life. They voted, had their own members of parliament, played rugby, fought wars, and intermarried with white New Zealanders. However, because most Marty lived in the countryside, their distinctive traditions were kept on the marae, out of sight of most Europeans. And the Second World War, and increasingly during the 1950s and 60s, there was a major migration of Marty into the city. In response, efforts were intensified to turn Marty into British New Zealanders. In schools and workplaces, Marty was, were still discouraged from speaking their own language. And housing poly, policy encouraged pepper potting dispersing the Māori population to prevent residential concentrations. The HUD report of 1960 recommended that New Zealand move beyond assimilation to integration, whereby New Zealanders would become one people through mixing the two cultures. In practice, because Māori were a minority, this tended to mean the swallowing of the smaller fish by the bigger. From the late 1960s on, some Māori began challenging this policy more vocally. Urban movements led by groups such as Na Tama Toa emphasized the need to strengthen Māori language, culture, and political power. In 1975, there was a protest march. Any of you involved in it? It uh, marched from one end of the North Island to the other, expressing unrest at the loss of Marty Land. In the same year, the Waitangi Tri Tribunal was established to deal with infringements of the 1840 Treaty of Waitangi. In 1981, the activist Donna Awatere published an argument for Marty's sovereignty. And as Māori began to promote their own traditions and values, the term biculturalism appeared. For some, this meant that New Zealanders could exist in one nation but as two peoples. Māori could speak their own language, pursue their own traditions, have their own educational institutions, such as Kohanga, Kohana Reo, preschool language nests, Kura Kopapa, Māori schools using Māori language, and Wānana universities <coughs> provide their own social services and control their own businesses. The financial settlements which flowed from Waitangi Tribunal recommendations began to make this possible. However, biculturalism was and still is resisted by some white New Zealanders considering themselves to be the real New Zealanders. That has put them on the back foot where multiculturalism is concerned. Prepared or not for it, multiculturalism was our future. Immigration was making the country multicultural. Until the 1960s, most immigrants to New Zealand were British and easily adjusted to New Zealand life. The considerable Dutch community, which benefits this congregation as well, arrived in the 1950s, but were expected to adopt local customs. But in the 1970s, there were two important changes. First, the end of assistance to British immigrants in 1975 challenged expectations that the British were the best potential New Zealanders. From then on, immigrants were officially to be chosen on non-ethnic grounds. Second, there were significant migrations from other countries. There was an influx first from the Pacific Islands and from the mid-1980s an increasing number from other places, predominantly Asia, but also from the 90s onward from Africa and the Middle East. In 1986, over 80% of New Zealanders identified as European. In 10 years, this dropped to 72%. During the 1990s, 
During that period, the proportion of people identifying with Marty, Pacific, and Asian ethnicities increased. In 2013, 74% of New Zealanders identified with one or more European ethnic groups. Many of these people from a wide range of cultures settled down, took up citizenship, brought up New Zealand-born children. This was a major challenge to the idea of who New Zealanders were. Initiated by Canada and picked up in the 70s in Australia, the concept of multiculturalism quickly spread to New Zealand. It was proposed that people could le be legitimate members of the New Zealand nation while retaining their own language, foods, and traditions. At the first New Zealand Day ceremony at Waitangi in 1974, there were ostentatious efforts to put New Zealand's ethnic variety on display. As the number of non-British people increased, their cultural differences became more evident. South Auckland Pacific Islanders congregated and evolved a distinctive New Zealand Pacific culture, which was more than the sum of their different cultures. Large Asian communities, who had originally been settled throughout the country, came together in areas with their own schools and styles of housing. Not everyone accepted these uh, developments with equanimity. A new political group emerged, significantly called the New Zealand Party, which expressed unease at the challenge to older traditions and New Zealandness, you know, like the buzzy bee. <laughs> Yet the issue was made more complex because by the early 2000s, in some very traditional areas, particularly sports and music, Pacific Islanders were playing an important role. In another arena, Cambodian bakeries now make classic New Zealand meat pies, winning national awards. <laughs> According to Teara, the Encyclopedia of New Zealand, at the beginning of the 21st century, it was not easy to define the New Zealander, not even to explain the origin of many New Zealand characteristics. The character of the country's people had been in part shaped by the physical environment, the outdoor climate, the proximity to beach and bush, the location of the South Pacific. No less important were the very different cultures brought to the country by waves of settlers. Marty, who arrived some 700 years ago from the Pacific, the British and Irish, who dominated the population for over a century from 1850, and more recent immigrations from Asia and the Pacific. All of these groups would have agreed that each were a New Zealander. All would have accepted that New Zealanders were no longer better Britons, but the cultural meaning of the New Zealander had become uncertain. This is reflected in the mocking of a recent New Zealand first proposal that new immigrants have to first pass a test on New Zealand values. One proposed satirical question is, true or false? New Zealand invented pavlova. Answer, true. If false, deport immediately. <laughs> For some, multiculturalism is perceived as a threat to the common good. Their argument is that different cultural values compete with each other, creating winners and losers. But in reality, the common good seeks the well-being of all. That a Cambodian can practice Buddhism does not prevent a Muslim from praying to Allah five times a day, or a Filipino from going to Mass. When I drink a glass of water, it does, not, it does mean no one else can drink that glass of water. But as water is a common good available to all, I have not taken anything from anyone. My fear for New Zealand is that if we don't come to find a way to celebrate the diversity of multiculturalism, the diversity multiculturalism offers us, it will be used to divide us, pitting us against one another as we're seen in the US, Germany, Hungary, 
Britain and France to name but a few. In a very short time, we went from being one of the most homogeneous countries on the planet to be one of the most culturally diverse. That's a lot to take in. But if we focus on the idea that everyone has something value to contribute to the communities in which we live, we may avoid the negative outcomes of multiculturalism. Just because a lot of cultures now reside in New Zealand doesn't make us multicultural. Choosing to relate to one another does. Valuing each other's contribution does. And that will result in an immense common good. Amen. For our meditation, I'd like you to get comfortable and take a moment to, in the silence, to reflect on those in your life who may be invisible because they are different ethnicity, uh, bring a different culture, and how you might help to make them visible. For my closing words, I've chosen some by Frederick Gillis. May the word, may the love that overcomes all differences, that heals all wounds, that puts to flight all fears, that reconciles all who are separated, be in, be in us and among us, now and always.